Okay. Um, I'm just gonna start first while people keep trickling in. So, yeah. All right, I'm gonna share another tab. All right, so welcome to the sixth virtual symposium from the GYP, which is also known as Global Youth Philanthropy. I'm Tiffany Lee. I'm a high school student from Alberta, Canada. And yeah, this is our guest speaker today. Her name is Nihad Musa. So what we're gonna be doing today first is um, when you first come into the meeting, it'd be great if you could introduce yourself in the chat in this format. For example, here, I'll do it first. Um, I'm a high school student from Alberta, Canada. And you could apply that to yourself. For example, if you're a college student from Tokyo, Japan, you can write that. If you're a parent from Beijing, China, you can also write that. And then I'm going to be going over a brief introduction for the GYP and the Youth for Intercultural Understanding Virtual Symposium. And then uh, we will be having a presentation from our guest speaker, and then we'll go through some questions and answers. Okay, so the mission of GYP is, first of all, GYP is a nonprofit organization and a President's Volunteer Service Award program that is certified and it helps to it helps you turn their passion and ideas into actual innovative philanthropic projects through coaching and connecting them to needed resources it also helps young students gain larger world perspectives and leadership through volunteering experiences and promotes communication and collaboration among youth philanthropic organizations around the world so some up objective and impacts of gyp and the Youth for Intercultural Understanding Virtual Symposium is that to provide opportunities for youth to familiarize themselves with diverse cultures and traditions around the world, promote respect, understanding, and appreciation for cultural diversity, build human connection, communication, and compassion, and as well as help develop intercultural competence, global citizenship, and leadership towards a future of peace. And also here we have a WeChat QR code, so if you want to scan the code you are we're you're more than welcome to do that so yeah some more objectives and impacts that we have had is that all the student participants in this program receive a gip certificate of participation for cultural competence you can submit and publish your reflections and opinions on blogs shared around the world and you can also become a guest speaker in future symposiums and if you're interested you can email the email that is on here which is youth for intercultural symposium at yahoo.com i'll write that into the chat if anybody needs it youth for intercultural symposium at yahoo.com yeah okay um so here are some of the current gyp events that we have going on right now the first thing is the gyp boston history club which is basically eight history seminars from october that starts from october 15 2022 and it's once a week each saturday in the evening and the topics include ancient greece history ancient rome history um, turkey's history and israel's history and more events for the debate and public speech club will be happening soon so if you want to contact us and join the clubs then you can get more details you can also scan this qr code if you want to if you want to register for any of these things or just get more details in general Okay, the second news release that we have here is the GIP 2022 Students Online Art Show, which is a GIP online art show and it's accepting new applications until October 2022, which is like right now. So if you want to register or participate, you can go to this website or you can, um, it also includes digital publication in the US. So yeah, if you want, if you're interested in that, you can, I'll show a QR code later that you can scan. And this is also the website. 
The third thing then is that we have our GYP 2022 students online concert and it's a virtual concert that will be online soon. It has about 25 young students that will show their musical talents and two parts which covers vocals and also instruments. Okay, so now I'm going to be introducing our guest speaker, who is Nihad Musa, and she's an in Egyptian international doctoral student in China. She's also a native Egyptian who currently conducts research in intercultural drama literature in the Northwestern University. And she has a master's degree in science, sorry, in Chinese linguistics and applied linguistics from Henan University. She has additionally translated several books from Chinese to Arabic, one, one of which is titled the, the Chinese Traditional Culture and Customs. So yeah, if you guys want to welcome our guest speaker, she will be giving a presentation. Oh, thank you, Tiffany, for this beautiful introduction and welcome everyone today. I'm really happy to have this opportunity to introduce Egypt to you. Actually, Egypt is a very mysterious country to so many people around the world. So I hope today it will not be more mysterious for you during this PPT. So let's start. Oh, Tiffany, you have you have share my PPT, right? Yeah, let's start with the first slide. This is the map of Egypt. Uh, Arab Republic of Egypt is transcontinental country spanning the northeast corner of, Af of Africa and southwest corner of Asia uh, via a land bridge formed by Sinai Peninsula. It's bordered by the Mediterranean Sea uh, in the north and Gaza Strap of Palestine to the northeast and the Red Sea to the east, Sudan to the south and Libya to the west. The Gulf of Aqaba in northeast separates Egypt from Jordan and Saudi Arabia. And uh, yeah, and Cairo is the capital and largest city of Egypt, while Alexandria <clears throat> is the second largest city and its important industrial and tourist hub at the Mediterranean coast. Egypt now has more than 100 million inhabitants. So it's the 14th most populated country in the world. So let's have a look on the flag, on the Egyptian flag. Next slide, please. As we see, the current flag of the Arab Republic of Egypt consists of red, white, and black horizontal straps. Red uh, represents the sacrifices and blood of Egyptian martyrs, while white symbolizes peace, and black stands for the dark period of occupation, and the eagle represents strength and power of Egyptians. So now so many people think about Egyptians. So all of you, I'm sure you know that Egypt have a very long history, it has 7,000 years of history. So it's a little bit confusing that Egypt now we are speaking Arabic. So how we come from being ancient Egyptians to the modern Egypt. So let's have a look on the Egyptian history. Next slide, please. I try to, uh, I try to, oh, next one. <laughs> Yeah, I try to conclude the very long dynasties of Egypt. So let's have a look. The first one, pre-dynastic period, it means since they start to write down the history, it was 5,000 years before birth. And then archaic period, and then all the kingdom, the age, uh, that age of the pyramid builders, and first intermediate period, and then middle kingdom, and then second intermediate period, new kingdom, third intermediate period and number nine was uh, from the late period of Alexander's conquest. Next slide. And then we had Roman conquest, Arabic conquest, Ottoman dynasty, French governor, British colonial in Egypt, and the last one, Republic of Arabic Egypt. So it's a little bit confusing. We have so many different of occupations and dynasties in Egypt. So, so many people are gonna think, what language do the Egyptians speak now? Because as we see, we have French governor. It means it has a big impact on us in Egypt as British and Ottoman, which means some people can speak Turkish in Egypt. So at the end, what language do we speak in Egypt? Let's see in the next slide. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we have in Egypt, 
in the past, we were talking the Coptic language and the Coptic language is a language family of closely related delegates. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the Coptic language is a language family of closely related delegates descended from the ancient Egyptians language and historically spoken by the Copts of Egypt, starting from the third century AD in Roman Egypt. Uh, and after that, Coptic was supplanted by Arabic as the primary spoken language of Egypt following the Muslims' conquest of Egypt and was slowly replaced over centuries. And nowadays, Coptic has no native speakers. So our official language now, let's see in the sec in the next slide. Yeah, it's Arabic. Now, literally Arabic is the official language of, of Egypt, which is liturgical language of Islam, uh, which is the majority religion and state religion of Egypt. And Egyptian Arabic is the commonly spoken language both uh, based on delicate of Cairo, and is occasionally written in Arabic uh, scraps or in an Arabic chat alphabet, mostly on new communication services. Uh, so maybe now you are more confused about the language of Egypt because I just said that we are speaking Arabic. So it means all Egyptians speaking Arabic regardless of the religion. Yeah, this is the fact. Let's see the next slide. Religions in Egypt. Actually, in Egypt, religion controls many aspects of social life and endorsed by law. Egypt as a place which is known for its unity and equality within the society, with Muslims and Christians living in harmony with each other. And as we see in this slide, let's have a look on that uh, pie chart. We can see, according to the 2019 data, Islam occupy 90 90.3% and Christianity occupy 9.6% and others like Judaism occupy like 0.01. And as we see here, these three different places in Egypt, which is very famous and very important for Muslims and Christians and Jews around, not only in Egypt, actually in, in the whole world. As we see here, the first picture to the left, this is the Al Azhar Mosque. It was founded in 97 and uh, 1970 by the Fatimids as the first Islamic university in Egypt. And uh, the second picture in the middle, this is the Coptic Orthodox Church of Alexandria established in the middle of the first century by St. Mark. And the third one to the right, this is Ben Ezra. It's an institution which is very ancient and has equipped at least three buildings in the history. The found data of the Ben Ezra, oh, sorry, who changed the slide, of Ben Ezra synagogue is not known. Uh, although there is a good evidence says that it predates 882 CE and it's probably Islamic. Uh, I just can't say about religion in Egypt, all people of different religion in Egypt, they have common history, national identity, race, culture, and language. And in this next slide, we can see, um, as I said, that religion is very important in Egypt, which is costumes and the clothing is very important too. So in Egypt, we can differentiate people, the, we can differentiate their uh, religious background from their how they wear. So this picture to the left, this is Muslims. This is the people who are studying in Al Azhar Mosque or Azhar University. <clears throat> and this is how uh, people in church wearing, and this is how Jews wearing. So the next slide takes us to the Egyptian costumes and clothing. So let's see the next slide, please. So many people now think we are wearing like ancient Egyptians or like pharaohs, but actually it's not the truth. Now, just like as you see in the picture on the left side, this is the this is the closing of the old Egyptians or sorry, ancient Egyptians or as being called or 
like fairies. I have only one comment on the fairies, uh, this nickname of Egyptians. Actually, fairies, this is big misunderstanding. So many people think that pharaohs are the ancient Egyptians. This, this misunderstanding that pharaoh is a king name. His name is, was pharaoh. And after that, it was taken as a name for all uh, ancient Egyptians. But I just want to uh, explain that pharaohs it's not correct, but it's just taken as a nickname. So there's no problem. I just try to uh, identify that. And as we see here, this kind of traditional costumes, the ancient Egyptians wearings, uh, we don't wear it now anymore. It just can be some kind of costumes for kids in costume party. And in some uh, occasions, big occasions and celebrations, international festivals or celebrations, our bloggers, our actors, they, they like to wear in this way, like that costume, ancient Egyptian costumes. Let's see the next slide. Yeah, I I didn't mention in the beginning, but I just want to say that Egypt is a very large country and we have so many local cultures inside Egypt. So as we see, if you go to Egypt, you're going to feel like white people wear in very different way from each other. So if you go to north and, and south, you're going to feel like there's a big difference and, and the same from the west to the east. So as we see here, this is the traditional costume for people in the south of Egypt. As we see the picture to the left, this is a loose fitting traditional Egyptian garment from the Nile Valley today. Is It's associated with farmers living in different cities. And this picture to the right side, this is how people like to wear in Aswan and Luxor. This is two cities in South of Egypt. They like colorful uh, costumes and even not only uh, clothing when you go there you're gonna find like even the homes they like to paint the homes in very different colors and it's very flowery there so let's see the next slide and in Sinai Peninsula this is how women like to wear and the picture to the right side uh, this is the costumes of Alexandria's people. They like to wear like short, uh, short dresses because, you know, at the, most of cities which is nearby the coast, they like to wear more short and more like easy. So let's see the next slide. Yeah, for current Egypt or for nowadays, this is how we wear in Egypt. So just like casual and we wear more like Western, uh, Western countries. And I want to comment here on something because most of people, they think like, mm, because it's related, it's a critical issue that our clothing, our how we wear is related to religion. So most of people think like there's no equality between women and men in Egypt because how we wear or our beliefs, actually, as I show in these two pictures in Egypt, there's a lot of women, they don't like to wear hijab or they don't like to be covered. And it's totally free in Egypt. No one gonna push you <laughs> to wear hijab or something like this. Yeah, let's see the next slide. Oh, we have been talking for a long time. So it's time to talk about food. Food in Egypt is very important and a very important part of our culture. Usually in Egypt, we eat like three meals a day and the most important meal per day is our breakfast. It's very rich breakfast as you see here. We have fava beans, which his name is full. And full is a stew cooked fava beans served with oil and lemon juice. And we have chickpeas, which name is falafel, and I'm sure that you can find there in where you live now because it's very popular food around the world. And we have different uh, kinds of cheese as well for breakfast. So we eat bread, eggs, and pickles. And for lunch, let's see the next slide. Yeah, for lunch, we have a variety of food for lunch. And usually we have lunch afternoon, maybe at three or four o'clock. 
And the first one I selected uh, to introduce today, the koshery. And koshery is Egypt's national dish and is it's widely popular street food, a traditional Egyptian staple, mixing pasta, rice, and brown lentils and topped with tomato sauce, garlic vinegar, and ranched with uh with chickpeas and the crispy fried onions and the second one we have stuffed food so many people when they go to egypt they feel like oh guys you can stuff anything like you can use any kind of vegetables and stuff inside some rice and meat actually this is the truth in egypt we have so many different of stuffed food and I think one of them could be a representative food for the stuffed food. We have uh, mumbar. This is a very, very, very popular food in Egypt. And uh, it's a kind of Arab sausage dish, especially popular in Egypt. It's made from sheep casting, a uh, casting stuffed with rice and meat mixture and deep fried. And the third one is kebab. I'm sure that you eat it before because it's not only in Egypt, it's around the world, which is very popular and very delicious. Let's have, let's see the second slide. Yeah, dinner in Egypt. Usually we have dinner at late time, like maybe at 10 p.m. Uh, so we usually have a light dinner like bread, cheese, and milk tea. Or some people, they like to eat again what they had in the morning, like the breakfast again. They're going to eat it again at night as a dinner. And next slide. Yeah, desserts in Egypt. It's, it's so amazing. <laughs> so let's see the first one. Its name is Om Ali, and it's the first picture to the left. Om Ali, actually, it's a translation of someone's name, Ali's mother. This is the meaning of Om Ali. And Om Ali is named after the wife of Sultan of Egypt, who asked her cooks to come up with the most delicious dessert they uh, could create. Uh, and then the chosen recipe was distributed throughout the country and become a national dish of Egypt. And uh, we have some Eastern deserts, uh, like the picture uh, to the right side. And the third one is Egyptian biscuits, which is very famous in Egypt. We usually bake this kind of biscuits after the holy month of Ramadan. And we're gonna explain the holy month of Ramadan in next slides. And then let's have a look on the uh, on the drinks, on the traditional drinks in Egypt. Let's see in the next slide. Yeah, the first one to the left, its name is Sobia, and it's produced from rice, coconut powder, and dairy products. The drink is widely produced and consumed during Ramadan. Ramadan is the holy month for Muslims in Egypt. And the second one is Larksh, and it's only served. We can say it's only served in Ramadan because it's not delicious, but it's good because we, in Ramadan, we stay a long time without uh, food without water so at night it's a good drink uh, you know to make up our thirsty during the day and the third one is its name is Mugat but we can speak we can pronounce it in English like Mugat uh, porridge this is the best choice for women after uh, childbirth because it's one of the milk producing drinks and it's a very effective, if you want to gain some weight, it's very effective because it has, a, sorry, it contains a high calories. And next slide, we're going to know more about holidays and festivals in Egypt. Let's see the next slide. Yeah, holidays and festivals. Public holidays are celebrated by the entire population of Egypt. Holidays in Egypt have many classifications. Some holidays are religious and other are secular, while some, uh, some of them can be fixed holidays on the calendar, while other are movable. There are four Islamic holidays and two Christian holidays. So let's see the first one, because, you know, owing to Egypt's 
uh, equality, the Christians' holidays of Esther and the Christmas posts are national holidays and festivals in Egypt, just like the Islamic holidays. As we see the first one, the Coptic Christmas is celebrated on the 7th of January and is celebrated all around Egypt, regardless of faith and religion. And the second one is another example of religious harmony of Egypt, which name is Eid al ghatas or as we see, as we say in English, is Baptism Day. And this, uh, and this festival, it comprises the baptism of Jesus Christ. And the third one, Revolution Day or the National Police Day is celebrates the day of beginning of Egyptian revolution of 2011, protesting then 29 years of uh, the rural Hosni Mubarak and celebrate, uh, celebrates the anniversary of police officers resistance against the British army in 1952 during the final month of the colonial era. And the number one, uh, number four, we have Sinai Liberation Day, and number five, as we see the Labor Day, and number six is June Day. Let's see the next slide. Uh, we have July Day, which is considered as Revolution Day and Armed Forces Day, Spring Festival. And Spring Festival is one of the most important festivals in Egypt. It's also known as Sniffing the Freeze Festival. The Sham al Nassim, its name is Sham al Nassim, uh, celebrates the arrival of spring. Like any other places, this ancient festival, which welcomes the spring, is celebrated by all the people, regardless of faith. Uh, and number eight is the Islamic New Year, the day of the year based on the lunar Islamic calendar. And number nine, uh, Mawlid al nabi the birth of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, and is celebrated with great festivals all around Egypt. And number 10 is a very, very, very important festival in Egypt, also known as the holiest day of the year. The holiday is celebrated by all Muslims around the globe and marking the end of the holy month of Ramadan. This festival uh, invites great celebrations, which goes on until past midnight. And the last one is Eid al-Adha, is popularly known as the sacrifice feast. This perhaps is the second holiest day of the year for Muslims around the world, not only in Egypt, is one of the two holidays that celebrates around the world. By Muslims, it celebrates the well of Abraham, the prophet Abraham, uh, one of the most important prophets in Islam. And now it's time to have a look on folk arts in Egypt. Let's see the next slide. Yeah, folk arts in Egypt. Actually, we have so many kinds of folk arts in Egypt, but today I only selected three kinds of them. The first one is Tanura dance. <clears throat> Uh, before we play the video, I want to tell you what is Tanura dance. Tanura is an Arabic word which it translates to skirt in English. It's a traditional folk dance in Egypt, where the dancers paints uh, to, the, to the tunes of Arabic songs. So let's play the video and have a look on Tanura dance. Uh, can you hear the voice? I can't hear the sound well. Oh, yeah, there's no music. Can you play it again? Yeah, I'll, I'll try it again. Yeah, let's play again. I think it's something to do with the screen share. Okay, wait. Okay, okay, no problem, no worries. Okay, I'll try to reshare it because it might be because I didn't share it with volume, hold on. Oh, yeah.
Oh, okay. Thank you, Tiffany. Okay, and the next one, I already chose the belly dance. Actually, Egypt has numerous folkloric and professional dance styles, but the most famous of which is belly dance. And the belly dance or jeans in Egypt that uh, is considered to be the most sensual, sensual female solo dance uh, in Egypt as it's identified by swaying hips and torso as well as smooth arms movements. The belly dance is always performed along to the Arabic music. So let's have a look in the next video of belly dance. I want to add some information. In Egypt, we have more than 40 international yes. Uh, and one of the most uh, popular and famous belly dancers in Egypt is this dancer. Her name is Fifi Abdu, and she has a very unique style of belly dance. So let's have a look in the video. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Tiffany. Thank you. <clears throat> and the third type of uh, folk arts we have in Egypt. Let's see the next slide. We have very unique jewelry design. <laughs> yeah, jewelry design is the art of profession of designing and creating jewelry. It's dating back at least 5,500 years back in Egypt. Uh, actually, this kind of jewelry is a little bit expensive, but I think every home in Egypt, every girl in Egypt at least should have one piece. I have so many pieces because I like it so much. And so I think if you want to go to Egypt, it's really precious. If you want to give some souvenirs, it's going to be a very pre precious souvenirs to get. Okay, let's have a look on the next slide. It's about the most popular parts in Egypt. Um, Egypt, just like most of African countries, which is very famous for football. So football is by far the most popular sport in Egypt and the Egyptian national football team called the Pharaohs has taken home the African Cup of Nations a total seven times. Uh, and we have, as you, I know, most of people now know Musala. So I like to mention that Musala is Egyptians and we have different let's see the next slide we have another sports like basketball like squash and let's see the next slide and volleyball and handball tennis and roller hockey yeah let's see the next slide Yeah, in the end, I like to recommend some places for you if you have an opportunity to go to Egypt. It's going to be an amazing journey. I can guarantee that because in Egypt, there's so many beautiful places to visit. So let's see in these pictures, we have, you know, show for sure the Giza pyramids and Islamic Cairo. Let's see the next slide. Yeah, this is Canel Khalili Market is one of the biggest marks in Egypt that you can find anything you need in your life, you can find there. And we have the Egyptian Museum. Let's see the next slide. And the place is highly recommended in Egypt as well. We have Cairo Tower and Salah al Din Citadel. And let's have the next slide. We had Alexandria city on the Mediterranean Sea coast. And as well in the south of Egypt, we have Aswan city. Let's see the next slide. 
and one of the most beautiful places in Egypt. We have the White Desert and Siwa Oasis. Let's see the next slide. And at last, we have Sinai Peninsula and Al Fayyum Waterfalls. And my PPT is ended here. And thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, we can start to ask and answer now. Thank you, Tiffany. Yep. So now is our questions and answers session. Again, if you want any information about GYP, you can go to any of these websites. You can follow us on Instagram, on Facebook. You can also email us about just like general GYP info or about the Youth for Intercultural Symposium in general. So yeah. Um, so oh, also you can scan these. You can scan these QR codes if you want more info as well. I see that so many people say I want to learn belly dance. Yeah, you can because anyway, if you can't go to Egypt to to learn in schools in Egypt, I think on YouTube you just need to write the Egyptian belly dance and then you can follow the <laughs> videos to learn Egyptian belly dance. Okay, so if anybody has any questions, you can feel free to type them in the chat. Or uh, yeah, if you want, you can unmute. Mm -hmm. I see the first one, Egypt and China are the, yeah, okay. This is a good question. <laughs> if you are talking about the ancient China and ancient Egypt, I think both of them, they have great civilizations, philosophy, unique way of thinking and culture. And if we're gonna talk about differences between ancient China and ancient Egypt, I think the biggest difference between them that China has the longest continuous history in the world as China has 3,500 of, of written history, but Egypt, we, because we have suffered from several and continuous occupation. Uh, so we didn't have such like China, such like uh, continuous, uh, history and the culture. Oh, that's a really good answer. Thank you. And oh, yeah, okay. let me let me let me let me continue because the question says um, some ancient. Yeah, because modern and ancient. If I'm talking about modern Egypt and modern China, actually both of them now are developing countries, and both of them has experienced war and peace and China for me I think for for Egypt now is an ideal example of economic development so I think this is a very common point that Egypt need to learn more from China about uh, economic development why did you choose to study in China <clears throat> what about Chinese China attracted you the most why I choose to study in China, it has, uh, it has a background because I started to study Chinese in Egypt as my, my bachelor degree. It was in Chinese language, literature and Chinese language. And I choose to study in China to continue my studies because my, I wanna be a teacher, I wanna be a Chinese teacher. So it was the best way to improve my Chinese to come to China and continue my studies in China. So what about China attracted me the most? I think everything here is attractive, really. <laughs> I like the Chinese, maybe I, I wanna say accurately, the most attractive thing is the Chinese culture. I like the culture and language so much. Yeah. Uh, uh, so can I speak in English or Chinese to answer this question? <laughs> um, I don't, okay. Yes, Chinese. <laughs> Chinese. Okay, so I'm going to 
，我觉得，因为我来到中国之后，我发现很多人可能待了在中国十多年。但是他们还没有学到为什么？因为我感觉到他们没有兴趣，他们觉得非常难。然后很多人他们就是这种，就是半途而废，就是学了一段时间，然后过了一段时间，哎呀，太难了，我不想学习了。但是呢，如果你心中有目标，你肯定会做到。然后学习中文中就是最直的方法，我觉得多说话，就是多跟别人沟通。因为环境的影响应该是最大的。我我看在国内有很多人，他们就是学习外语的时候，会觉得我没有达到我想要的呃那个水平。但是可能他们去国外，然后自己去别的国家学习别的国家的语言，他们会觉得，哎呀，我真的我又进步了。所以呢，从这个这一点出发，我觉得最最重要的就是你多沟通。多跟别人就是多说，把你的口语练口语。然后第三个是，如果你有机会去别的国家看看，自己体验一下，呃，就国外的环境，那肯定会学习更好的。哦，哦 ，Thank you，Thank you。呃 you.、Uh, ，我们目前在河南，欢迎，对吧？谢谢，谢谢。Any advice or what not to do when one visit Egypt? Yeah, there's a lot of things you can do, and I can give you some advices before going to Egypt. Number one,、uh, it's better to find a tour guide. If you are going alone, maybe you're gonna be deceived because of money, because some people they like you, they feel like yeah, you're a foreigner, so I'm gonna get a lot of money from you. So it's better to find a tour guide. And I think in Egypt now it's a little bit we can say a little bit cheap if you want to go. You don't need to to take a lot of money.、Uh, and uh, more advice. Actually, Egypt is very safe.、Um, there's nothing special. Just try to prepare. Uh, enough money with you, and if you can find a tour guide, it will be better. 呃，请问为什么你选择从语言学习，呃，学习语言学本本级研究，转到文学研究？啊，我看到你的本科毕业论文是中国现代文学郭沫若作品的分享研究，呃，这还不会不会非常难。我还想问一下，对一个国外的人来说，你做别别的文学研究遇到什么困难啊？我跟你说吧，就是学习语言，你不能光学习语言。我就是我在埃及的时候，我本科的时候就是学习语言，是吧？然后过了一段时间，你会觉得这个语言不是目的，语言是一个工具。如果你想发展起来，因为我们都是不是要挣钱吗？所以呢，你就去做一种研究，你不能一辈子靠语言或者靠翻译这个工作。所以你去研究，你多写文文，你你多去了解，你这样的话可以发展起来。然后我现在不是在学习中国文学，中国文学是我自己的爱好。我现在翻译工作就是中国当代文学，特别是中国西部山西的作品，因为我觉得。非常非常好的，这么好的作品，世界需要看这样的那个非常非常优秀的作品，就看别人怎么想的，中国人怎么过日子，我觉得这个真的值得反映出来。然后，如果在研究方面，我不仅是研究那个文学。我的研究方向就是文化，就是中国文化各个方面和阿拉伯的文化各个方面对比起来，然后这样的话，我觉得对中国学者他们这样的话会更好了解阿拉伯的那个文化，和这样的话，通过我的翻译，我觉得阿拉伯读者这样更了解中国，就是促进，呃，中国和阿拉伯世界的关系。为什么？稍等，稍等。问题太多了，呃，为什么关于埃及的旅行点或者路线，路线推荐吗？<笑>自助啊、哦，自助行的，希望能了解更多的埃及。啊、呃，我刚才我刚才不是推荐了这个这个这个地方吗？
呃，就是那个埃及金字塔开去开落的时候，我觉得开落如果有那边旅游的话，只需要三天，你可以走就走完那个开落，然后这还有亚历山大。还有沙漠沙河，还有那个卢克斯，还有那个阿斯旺，这些地方真的非常非常漂亮，还有值得去一次。呃，请问，肚皮屋起源埃及还是印度有什么不同？呃，其实有很多的学者，有很多的历史，就是根据历史那个那个那个证据来说，我觉得不能说。在埃及出出来了，或者在印度出来了，我觉得印度有印度的呃肚皮舞，埃及有埃及的肚皮舞。但是根据历史证据，就是肚皮舞就是从埃及出来了，因为这个可能是四千年，就是公元前四千年，呃，在埃及出来了。呃，我不知道在印度什么时候出来了，但是我确定在埃及是公元前四千年。呃，请问埃及肚皮舞啊，这个已经说好了。I hear that you are proficient in four language. What significance does the this have for life? Ah,、uh, does this have?、Uh, I can't understand this question, but I know that. Yeah, I get the point. Um, I have studied four language, but now I'm only speaking three language. I have. Because my mother tongue is Arabic, my second language is English, and the third language now is Chinese.、Uh, I had studied the French in my high school for three years, but it's gone now because you know if you don't practice language, you cannot keep it in your mind.、Um, what do these three language bring to my life? It has bring a lot of things.、Um, I can conclude in three points in my life. It makes me see in the world, like try different kind of thing of thinking, like how people think. So I can get more. And about my feelings, I think learning language it's deepen your your feelings because sometimes you feel like when I'm gonna speak in Chinese, there is some worse. When I speak it in Chinese, it makes me feel a special feeling, and it's really different from from different language. So I think after studying more languages, I have more feelings. Like I have not more feelings, but I have deep feelings. I can feel more about things. And it makes me more flexible. Like I can accept more and more people and different ways of thinking. And what does it bring to my work? So it brings a lot because my studies, my work, how I earn money, <laughs> my work depends on language. So it's very important. 请问去埃及旅行有什么啊、uh, 民宿胜地方吗？还是有旅游？还是还是旅游馆，其实，在埃及很少特别。如果给外国人推荐的话，这种那个民宿非常非常少的，会有的，那是比较少的。就是为了外国人的安全，最好的是就是去找一个比较，呃，旅行的或者这种那个呃 ，four stars or five stars 呃，宾馆或者那个酒店会更好的、更安全的。呃、uh, ，非常喜欢埃及独皮舞，希望有一天可以去埃及旅行。我希望你们都会有一天去埃及旅行，享受埃及的美丽。啊、uh, ，还有别的问题吗 ？Is there any questions? You把优秀的中国作品给世界，谢谢。我觉得这是应该的，这么好的作品给别人看看是应该的。啊，Any <笑> <笑>没关系，没关系。山西有非常非常多的优秀的呃作家，呃，我非常非常喜欢路遥先生的作品，哎呀，非常非常好的。还有贾平凹呀，我我我翻译过贾平凹散文选的书。
，呃，虽然他的那个图画比较重的，就是方言非常复杂的，但是非常非常好呢。所以可以说我最爱的就是《路遥》和《家平蛙》。啊，语言是一种工具。呃，第一次来到中国时，你呃印象最深刻的是什么？呃，其实来到中国之前，我已经对中国有一种印象，就是人家就是中国人非常热情的。呃，然后没有想到是这么热情。<笑>你看，就是一瞬间，我在中国已经过了五年的时间。如果我觉得中国人不是这么热情，我继续不下去。<笑>所以可以说，就是最深刻的影响就是中国人非常非常热情的，很善良的。埃及，呃，您最推荐吃的食物有什么？哦、呃，其实，在埃及，甜点。啊，如果你就是怕发胖的话，就不要吃。但是对我来说，埃及的甜点，哎呀，非常非常好吃的。呃，然后我们的那个啥，我们的奶酪，呃，埃及的奶酪有各种各样的奶酪，也非常非常好吃的。然后就是那个那个啥 ，street foods， 哎呀，非常非常丰富的。但是如果我说我最最喜欢的是什么呢？就是 stuffed food。呃，就各种各样的 stuff food， 非常非常好吃的。方言对你的阅读会有影响吗？其实没有什么影响，因为我觉得，到底那个方言还是有一些里面还有一些普通话的那个那个影响。你可能猜出来，可能就是在表面上你读的时候会觉得，哎呀，这是什么意思呀？但是如果你就读几遍之后，你会猜出来，所以就基本上方言没有什么没有什么困难的。呃，感觉西部的作家方言词汇会有更多一点。呃，其实呢，说实话，就是那个如果说贾平凹老师的那个作品，呃，人家都说，呃，贾平凹写的都是那个上洛河的话的那个那个方言，但是。基本上这个不是方言，这个是古代汉语。如果你想去了解古代汉语的话，你就去读他们的那些作品，你会更了解古代汉语，呃，那些词汇。呃，然后其他的作家，我可能，呃，可能因为我时间比较比较紧，但是基本上我就如果我看到什么不明白的什么词汇，我可能去问我。我就是西安的朋友们，或者我自己去搜索一下，在百度上就了解一下，就是这个地方的方言，人家说这句话是什么意思。呃，应该困难不多，就是多努力一些，不会有困难的。嗯，还有吗？啊，而且真的，我真的很喜欢韩语，是的，很感谢啊、哦，谢谢谢谢。嗯、呃，哦，呃，对于少年在阅读方面有什么建议？呃，就看情况吧，就是因为我还是觉得每个人有自己的兴趣，有自己的爱好，有的人不喜欢读书。呃，但是最我可以说最有效的方法就是，如果你不喜欢读书的话，你多下载那些呃软件，就是呃读书的那些软件。呃，但是有什么建议？如果他们要就是要增加他们的兴趣的话，一开始要简单一些。就是看看，因为呃，就看如果是男孩的话或者女孩的，就是兴趣不一样。就是如果女孩的话，可能喜欢这种那个浪漫的书；男生的话就喜欢，可能喜欢这种那个恐怖的什么恐怖的书，或者就是那个那种那个呃喜欢历史什么的。就是看你自己喜欢什么，然后一开始就要选择比较简单的。就是这种那个尝试的书，然后你了解之后，你慢慢会增加、增强你自己对阅读的那个欲望和兴趣
啊、哦，还有别的问题吗？嗯、um, ，So we have time for about like one last question. <laughs> last question, yeah. Yeah. And also a reminder to scan these QR codes if you're interested in any details about GYP. There's also two emails that you can email if you want if you have more inquiries. You can also follow us on our social medias and our website. Presentation. Thank you. Really thought. 谢谢 ，Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Okay, well, that should be the end of our sixth. I'm sorry, our sixth virtual symposium and. Okay, apologies. I have a very different day. Um, I, I hope you recover soon. <laughs> thank you. And yeah, if um she has any words, um, we'd be more than happy to hear those.